Hey everybody, welcome to Phalanx Frequency, the channel where all we talk about is aircraft maintenance for aircraft owners. If that sounds like something you guys would be interested in, make sure you hit the like or subscribe button below to keep this thing going because, uh, well, we want to hear from you. Okay, so uh, I got my clipboard here, I got my coffee, let me get a sip here. As you know, I record all my videos in the early morning, so I'm going to calm down a second here and grab a drink of coffee. Okay, I got my notes. I want to make sure I stay on topic here. So today we're going to talk about aircraft engine overhauls. Um, this is uh, one of the more, uh, this is one of the larger expenses for a lot of piston aircraft owners. Uh, I've seen it where, honestly, I've seen times where the overhaul has actually cost more than the aircraft. In the case of like a 150, maybe if it had a bad cam and a cracked case or something like that, then uh, the engine overhaul can definitely end up being a costly expense. Um, but it's a necessary evil. You have to have a, a good power plant to pull your aircraft through the sky and a reliable one for that. So um, I got on my clipboard here some of the stuff we're going to talk about today. And uh, the first thing I kind of want to talk about is what, what options are available when, you, when you're looking at doing something with your piston engine. Uh, so there are typically three areas and we'll kind of talk about a fourth one, but let's just say there's four things you can do when your engine, uh, well, let me back it up. Uh, just in case I haven't covered this, we're going to go ahead and talk about the different solutions for your in aircraft engine. When it needs attention, we're going to talk about TBO time between overhauls, what that means. Do you need to comply with it? And this is all for piston aircraft engines. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about aircraft engine accessories. These are things like mags, carburetors, uh, fuel pumps, um, turbos, tur uh, density controllers, stuff like that. And what, what part do they play and when you should uh, give them attention to. Um, we'll talk about uh, some weak points of some engines, but there's so many different engineering um, designs for the engines that we're going to talk about some really common ones in some of the common engines, but we'll talk about some of the weak points on some of these engines in the piston world. Um, we'll go ahead and talk about who you should pick to overhaul your engine and how to qualify the shop. So I kind of want to give you a quick rundown of what we're going to cover in this lesson because a lot of you guys will look at the first 10 seconds, 15 seconds of the video, maybe the first minute and decide if it's what you want to watch or not right away. That's what we're going to cover. So. Um, we're going to start off with what are the solutions when you need to uh, give your aircraft engine some attention. You know, let's say it's uh, just spewing oil everywhere. Let's say it's uh, got a Lycoming four cylinder. It's got 2000 hours on it and it's at TBO or above TBO time between overhaul. What are you going to do? You know, what are your options uh, for many guys? Unfortunately, that haven't saved money or don't have money set aside their their option is to keep going. And um, that's not an issue, but uh, at the end of the day, I'll go ahead and start off with saying if you should always have some engine reserve set aside. Uh, the best thing that we did um, when I was a part of an owner in a flight school for some time, and uh, we had an engine reserve, just like most people that uh, budget their finances for their plane. And we uh, took, um, I think we changed our hours a lot, but it was 2,500 hours on a four cylinder 0320 Lycoming because we ran Cherokees and 172s. We took the 0320 time between overhaul, which was 2,000 hours, and we said, you know, we're not going to overhaul this thing at TBO. And so we decided on 2,500 hours as being the benchmark of when we're going to go and decide to uh, take these things out and overhaul them which we later found out that we kept operating it. And we have some at uh, one at 3,500 hours. And I'll tell you a little bit more why we decided to go to 3,500 hours. We essentially kept going with the motor. But um, so we, we set aside, uh, depending on how much time was on the engine when we acquired the plane, dictated how much we would set aside for the overhaul. So if it had... Uh, 500 hours since TBO on the overhaul, then we we would take uh, the amount of hours remaining between 2,500 and 500 hours, and take the overhaul cost, and that gives you your hour 
your dollar per hour you have to set aside to cover the overhaul cost. And I think we had the overall cost at like $30,000. And that was to like have a, a certified repair station do the overhaul, a legitimate shop. So, um, and it panned out, I can't remember the math. I think it was always 15, 20, 25 bucks an hour is what we threw in per hour to cover an overhaul. So my first thing is, without going on a tangent, if you don't have a, a per hour amount that you're putting away for an overhaul, why don't you uh, go ahead and get that started today? And you can just simply find out what you have to put away by taking uh, your engine overhaul cost divided by the hours that you have until you want to overhaul the engine. Okay, so um, that's simple. That'll give you your hourly amount that you have to put away for engine overhauls. So the different options you have for an engine when it comes time to overhaul it are overhaul, right? And I, these are this is terminology right out of the FARs. There are there's terminology thrown out in the aviation world, but this is straight to the point, right down to what's going to go in the logs, right down to what comes out of the FARs. So overhaul is one option. Uh, let me look at my notes here. Rebuilt is another option. New is another option, and then uh, the fourth one, which it's kind of like, what is it? It's it's going to fall under one of those three. The fourth or the the fourth one will, the option, but it's STC engine upgrade. What do you, you can also do that, but it's an STC is going to legally fall under overhaul, rebuild, or new. Um, and so let's talk about that. Okay, if you're getting your engine uh, overhauled. You're typically taking your engine and the engine overhaulers disassembling it and inspecting it, cleaning it, inspecting it, and repairing things as necessary, and then measuring things to make sure they fit the, the specs for an overhauled engine. Lycoming and Continental publish these specs, and these specs for an overhauled engine are not as tight or strict as a new engine. But it's there, you know. The, if it's within overhaul limits, like uh, crank and bearing clearances, uh, you name it. There's clearances for a lot of things within the engine, and and if they fall within a certain range, they can be overhauled, and they the part can be reused. So, during an overhaul, a shop is taking the engine apart. They're cleaning it. They're uh, inspecting it. They're replacing mandatory replacement parts, which we will talk about later. And then they are uh, making sure that the tolerances are within overhaul limits and they are reassembling the engine, testing the engine and returning it back to service. Okay, rebuilt, same process except the tolerances are, are tighter um, and the engine gets granted a zero timed uh, entry in the locks. So like with an overhaul, your total time of your engine keeps carrying forward, right? So like, your since major overhaul time will go back down to zero on an overhaul, but your total time on the engine will continue to move forward. On a rebuilt engine, that total time goes down to zero. So it zeroes out the total time. In return to be able to do that, the tolerances have to be tighter. Um, on the, the limits for the overhaul, the clearances are wider. The clearances for uh, rebuild are tighter. And so therefore, um, and the, the, who can do rebuilds is more strict. So usually it's approved repair stations, which I don't know of too many of those or the manufacturer. Uh, they're the only people who can do the rebuilt process of an engine. So they're typically more, you know, we're talking about cost here too. An overhaul is the cheapest. A rebuild is going to be the next best thing and the next up in cost item. And then the third item is new. Uh, and obviously we all know what new is. This is an engine built from raw material. It has not been ran before. It is brand new, coming right from light or Continental and just getting manufactured perfectly for your plane. So there you have it. Overhaul, rebuilt, new. With new, obviously your engine time starts at zero. Your sense major overhaul starts at zero. With rebuilt, your sense major overhaul uh, goes to zero your since new time goes to zero as well but the engine is technically it's been ran so it's but they get to go down to zero and so the rebuilt world's kind of the best of all worlds it's right in the middle cost wise and um, you get to reset your total time on your engine
And then the overhaul is the least expensive and that's simply resetting your sense major overhaul time, but your total time your engine carries forward. I'm sure that you guys understand all that. It's at the end of the day, you have to do some digging if you uh, want to look up the regs on it, but that's in a summary the times for the overhauls or excuse me, that's the options you have for your engines and that is uh, the different levels of what you can do. And then I talked about, give me a sec here. I haven't done a show in a while, so I feel a little off rhythm, but um, we'll get there. Okay, so uh, the last thing, the fourth thing, the STC one. Okay, so we're talking options that you can do when your engine is needs attention your piston engine and the last one is stc and and if you're going to upgrade the engine it's the time now's the time when you're doing an overhaul or replacing the engine that is the time to upgrade the engine with an stc uh because it's going to be the most cost beneficial way to do the upgrade and uh, like i said before let's say you go with like a ram power on a four-cylinder lycoming that gives it 10 extra horsepower it's replacing the pistons and the cylinders with some higher compression pistons. And um, that's, an easy, that's an easy thing to do, right? And it's good to do it at overhaul. Um, some of these, there's more elaborate STCs out there. Like you can put a whole different motor uh, engine to an airframe and things like that. But um, it's time to do it when you do the engine swap because that's going to be the cost beneficial way. With an STC option... It's going to fall within your engine itself will still follow new rebuilt or overhauled. It's going to follow one of those options legally. And then the, it's going to have paperwork to support an STC upgrade or change or modification. So uh, really the STC is not considered an option. Uh, it's just an upgrade. And so... But it is something to note when you're doing an overhaul, you want to kind of look at the STC. All right, let's move on to TBO. TBO stands for time between overhaul. And the manufacturers out there have, uh, I'm going to speak to Lycoming and Continental because that's the majority of piston aircraft engines out there flying. They both have published documents. If you Google TBO Continental or TBO Lycoming, I don't have the, the, the document right offhand, but that's, it's literally, if you Google that, it'll show up because it's very common. It'll spit out a list of all the engines and the TBO for each one. And the TBO is what the manufacturer has established as their recommended time to overhaul the engine in hours. Now, uh, you t there are various exceptions. I think there's uh, Lycoming, I know, has an exception where you can extend the TBO 200 hours, 400 hours, if you meet certain um, operating procedures. And, and it's flying the aircraft so many times, so many hours per month, doing oil changes at a certain interval with a full, fl full flow cartridge filter. Um, so you can extend the TBO, but there's really only a couple ways you can do that. So, and it's not, it's not like you extend the TBO by thousands of hours. It's usually just a couple of hundred hours. So um, time between overhaul is what TBO stands for. Now, uh, that's what the manufacturer recommends. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to. Depending on what FAR you're operating your plane under uh, will dictate whether it's a requirement or not. If you're an FAR part 91 operator, then you don't, do not have to follow the TBO recommendation of the manufacturer. There are probably, as with most things in life, there's an exception somewhere out there. You know, if, if there's a 91 operator that the FAA has, they've got some kind of special thing going where they have to get um, their engine overhauled. Of course, there's probably rules out there that, that are uh, gonna be an exception to this, but as a blanket rule, FAR 91 operators, that's like the general operating guy that doesn't use his plane for commercial operations, you do not have to follow the TBO. Um, and there's uh, guys out there, I'm, I'm not gonna say names, but there's 
tons of articles out there. There's tons of guys out there super knowledgeable about this that have covered this topic. And I'm just echoing what they're saying, but you don't, uh, it's up to you what you want to do. Our recommendation is that we would not follow TBO. It depends on the engine and the condition. It's always about the engine and condition uh, in our eyes. And so, excuse me, um, TBO is, can be followed if at the point, at, if the engine reaches TBO, there are certain indicators that make us believe that we should replace the engine or do something, then we will do it. But if there are no indicators at TBO of an engine that it needs to have attention, then we don't do anything. Or we don't do the overhaul, I should say. We'll, we'll always address anything that needs attention. But um, so, no, you do not have to if you're a 91 operator follow TBO. If you're a 135, a charter operator, or 121, uh, sched scheduled airline operator, you're going to have to follow TBO. And uh, so we're not going to really go into that with those guys, but uh, the 91 guys, you don't have to follow it. So um, I'm checking my notes here. Give me a second. Uh, we talked about the extension, talked about the, uh, that it's the manufacturer's recommended time is what TBO is. So here's what we do. And I'm, uh, when the planes that we operate or the customers we have, um, when they hit TBO, we obviously put them on, we put them on a different kind of schedule. We do obviously oil changes have to be done at the recommended time. So 50 hours for filters, 25 hours for screens. But um, we also put them on, on, on an oil analysis program. It's up to the owner of the, cons the frequency. It's got to be like every oil change or every other, but it's got to be a very constant oil frequency. We have to pull an oil analysis. And um, this really boils down to um, just an extra layer of security. Now that the engine's getting up there in time, we're just going to go ahead and uh, get it on a oil analysis program, which is a very cheap way of just another insurance blanket to look at trends of the engine to see if we can find, uh, if we can catch something before it becomes a problem. So all engines that go over TBO for us go into an oil analysis program. Um, we also check the sump screen. Uh, we start checking that more frequently. A lot of guys that do filter changes, whether they're supposed to or not, they don't check the sump screen. But at TBO, you wanna do it every other uh, oil change. Check that sump screen. Make sure that uh, there's not big debris in the bottom of the oil pan. And for those of you who are wondering what that is, uh, the engine has a couple ways to filter the oil for the whole engine. And the filter is at the top of the gravity wise. It's kind of at the top of the engine. So at the bottom of the engine is where the sump screen lives. And that's in the oil sump. It is filtering out the metal before it hits the oil pump in most cases. Now, there's probably some exceptions on engine designs, but I'm talking uh, in general, the piston engine world is uh, oil gets sucked in through this screen, this oil sump screen, and then it goes through the oil pump, and then it goes through the filter, and then it goes out to the engine. Okay, so that sump screen doesn't get checked very often at oil changes. At TBO, we do it every other oil change. So we're going to start looking at that oil sump screen. So you add the oil analysis component to the engine. You add the oil sump screen inspection to the component. This adds about another hour of time to each oil change, right? Uh, depending on the sump screen location, it can add more. But the paperwork to fill out an oil analysis is a half hour. And um, so, yes, you add a little labor to each oil change. But this is all insurance to kind of make sure the engine's doing okay. And uh, we operate the engine until we get to a point where we decide, hey, either the engine reaches 3,500 hours and we're just like, it's time, or the engine, something comes out in the oil filter and we decide, hey, we need to look at the, we need to pull the engine because it's bad. So those are, after TBO, we start putting the engine on these certain parameters or certain procedures to kind of check it a little more closely. And we still don't, we don't have an hour, 3,500 is kind of what we use for lycomings, but we let the engine go past TBO and we just check 
oil filter, oil sump screen, and oil analysis. And we continue to check those things until we get a red flag. And when we get a red flag, then we pull the engine. Uh, and with like four cylinder Lycomings the, and a lot of engines, the uh, weak point is the cam follower and cam area. Uh, this is um, a high friction area and that's why Lycoming kind of changed the design to a roller uh, design, less friction on the cam lobe. But uh, at the end of the day, it's, I, I don't know how I feel about those newer style engines other than I've seen them fail a little bit more frequently. Uh, mechanically, I've seen them bend push rods and stuff a little more. With the, with the regular follower design, it's a great design, it's just high friction. So like that is a weak point of the Lycoming engines. And um, if you can keep that going, why we find that those four cylinder Lycomings tend to last a long time. So um, let's move on to the accessories of the aircraft engine. So uh, another thing we do when your aircraft engine hits TBO is, and you don't want to do anything about it, we do an analysis of the accessories because it's important that we find out what is going on. Uh, the internals of the engine are one thing, but like it needs a lot of components to run. So like uh, we want to make sure that the critical accessories for the engine are in good shape. So if you're going to run this thing past TVO, make sure your uh, items like your turbo, <coughs> excuse me, a turbo, uh, let's just stop. If you are running a pressurized uh, engine, a uh, uh, turbocharged engine, a normally aspirated engine, or excuse me, a normalized engine, uh, then you're going to have a turbo system. And that turbo system has some components in it that, in my opinion, need more attention more or more often than uh, the engine itself, the internals. So if you're going to go past TBO, make sure that you start, do be very adamant on your oil changes because the turbo main bearing is fed by that oil. And that turbo main bearing spins very fast and um, much faster than the engine itself uh, operates and so it needs a good clean supply of oil all the time and if you run your oil changes past 50 hours I would even recommend reducing your oil changes down to 40 or 30 hours if you have a turbo engine and your past TBO it's just gonna be better for the engine in general and so if you have a turbo and you're going past TBO look at the make sure you change your oil frequently and make sure that you inspect the blades on the turbo, the exhaust and inlet blades at every 100 hour, and make sure that, um, uh, what's the last thing? Oh, you check the things like the waste gate controller and the density controller. The turbo system is usually gets super, the turbo itself gets really hot, the waste gate gets super hot. So laying eyes on these components as they age is super important. And um, because they take a lot of beating. So um, you want to make sure you take a look at those. And then on the other side of the accessory world is the uh, other critical ones are like the magnetos. Make sure you stay up with those. Either stagger the 500 hour inspections. If you're going to go past 500 hour inspections on your mags, it's not like you have to do the 500 hour. But if you're running like slicks, for example, and you got one that's like a thousand hours, be ready because that thing, you just might as well get rid of it. Overhauling a slick is like, um, I guess what I'm getting at is a slick magneto that's gone 100 hours without being opened up, you're going to have problems inside it. It's going to be a matter of what is wrong with it. Uh, and because, you know, there's wearable parts in magnetos. There's a reason why 500 hours is the benchmark. And that's because there's things like the points and the cam for the points the condenser and uh, stuff like that, that are going to wear out. They're not infinitely going to keep going. And so 500 hours is a good time to get in there and take a look at all that stuff. But if you're not going to follow the 500 hour mag rule, just um, my advice would be to stagger it. If you don't want to do both of them 500 hours at the same time, then maybe you do one mag at 500 hours and you do the other one at the other, you know, you do one mag at 500 hours. If, if that cuts your budget down a little bit, great, but there's, it's a dual redundancy system. So therefore, if, if you at least go after one mag and get it looked at, then it's going to help you out. Um, but 
we recommend you do both mags. So make sure the mags are up to snuff um, and good to go. And then your fuel pumps. So like I'm trying to hit up on all accessories are important, but when we look at the critical accessories, you know, the starter on an airplane is important, but if the starter fails, you're going to keep flying. If your magnetos fail, you're not going to keep flying. So we're going to touch on like the important parts that you need to make sure because there is a lot to do on maintenance for an airplane. So we want to make sure we hit the critical parts. Uh, make sure your fuel pumps are good to go. The electric fuel pump is simple as doing a quick check to make sure that you turn it on. It's getting pressure. Um, that way, if the mechanical drops out, you got a good electric pump. Do not go flying without the electrical pump because we have seen mechanical pump failures, uh, specifically in the diaphragm area. There's a, there's a diaphragm in most engine driven fuel pumps and they will fail. They're, they're not going to go on forever. So, um, that electric fuel pumps nice when you run out of fuel pressure. Okay. So, uh, weak points, uh, weak points of the engine. I already talked about this, but in, uh, from a lot of the engines, it's the cam and cam follower area. That's super, um, critical on these engines because one, when your cam decides to start going, uh, and what the, what I'm talking about here, the cam and cam follower in a piston aircraft engine is the mechanism. The cam is the mechanism that opens and that starts the sequence of opening and closing the exhaust and intake valves. And that obviously needs to happen for the, for the piston engine to perform its, uh, com, uh, power cycle or the force, the four stroke cycle involves opening and closing of the valves. And the cam is responsible for starting that sequence. So um, the lobes on the cam are what actually starts the pushing of the um, valve train to open the valves. And so um, the, when the cam lobes start to go or they're, uh, they're starting to, the metal, what happens is the cam follower rides on the cam lobe and eventually it's the cam follower degrades the face of it or the cam lobe face degrades. And uh, there's a hardened surface be on both of them, which means like there's a machining process or a finish process, I should say, that makes the surface of these components super tough, right? So they're, they're really resilient and they're meant to take on like um, maybe some higher friction loads. But the point is, is that it still will break through that at times. These, uh, if you, keep putting pressure on it, it's going to break through this hardened surface. And when it does, it's very aggressive in which now it's going to eat at the metal much quick, much more faster, I should say. And excuse me on my, my terminology, I'm a mechanic. So I'm going to say things that may not make a hundred percent sense, but hopefully you're getting my point. Um, and so, uh, the cam and cam followers, the weak point. The issue is that you can't replace the cam uh, without cracking the case in half. So it's it's like an overhaul. If, you're, if your cam's going bad, you're going to have to rip the engine out, tear the engine apart, and repair it or overhaul it or do something about it. If your cam followers are starting to go, if it's a Continental, there are certain models that you can remove the cam follower and replace it without having to take the engine out and break the case. And Lycoming's most of them, that's not the case. The cam followers, if they're bad, it's got to come out. Typically speaking, when unless you catch it right, if a cam follower is going out, the, the cam lobe that is with that cam follower is probably also bad as well. So the weak points of some of these engines is the, the cam and cam follower. Another weak point that we've seen is cracking in the casing. And uh, so... We, these are the two things that we've seen a lot of. A crack in a case is obviously as simple as it gets. It's literally the case of the engine has a crack in it. And usually, it, hopefully, it doesn't start or end up in a catastrophic failure. But we've seen it where there'll be a crack and there's oil coming out of it to start, right? And that's, that's kind of how we spot it is that there's an excessive amount of oil and, um, coming from this area. We clean it off, look at it, and sure enough, there's a crack in the case. Um, this is definitely where you have to pull the engine and, uh, you have to get it repaired. Cases can be welded, so you can weld the crack in some areas. They can be welded in some areas they can't. So it really depends on, um, your engine, your model and 
uh, if you send your case off what they're going to say but it can be repaired within certain limits so um, those are the two biggies for us cam uh, valve train area cam and cam follower and case cracks those are the weak points we see all the time all right let's talk about the last topic of this episode and that is um, who should you pick to overhaul your engine um, you know obviously you should pick someone who has experience with piston engines um, there's a lot of overhaul shops out there and there's a lot of good ones and there's a lot of bad ones and we always think that you should kind of empower yourself to qualify yourself to pick the right one so we always think of it as like qualifying a shop to do work for you so because they're your their customer so um, to qualify a good overhaul shop I would make sure that they're following uh, if we're looking at a couple FARs here and a couple of service bulletins if you got a continental engine check out service bulletin 97-6 and the revision letter afterwards is going to change so I didn't include that but the latest version of continental service bulletin 97-6 is um, going to cover what are mandatory replacement parts when doing an aircraft engine overhaul when you talk to an overhaul facility you want to ask them hey what parts are you guys replacing at overhaul this is a big one because a lot of the mom pa or a and p dude uh, out of his garage doing work uh, they don't follow that they won't follow it because it's a pain in the butt to get all the parts ordered or they, they didn't get the part so they're just going to kick it out the door and so they're going to they're going to skimp on this and so technically they're not able to call an overhaul but it happens all the time so they're going to do it so to qualify the shop ask them what are the replacement parts you guys are doing for the overhaul this is one question to ask what parts are you guys replacing at the overhaul and then you can print you can have continental service bulletin 97-6 out while you're asking them uh, the others for lycoming that service bulletin is uh, number 240 so they both have service bulletins covering mandatory replacement parts and that's kind of uh, what you want to follow when you want to pick a shop that uh, is going to do your overhaul another great thing to ask the shop is can you just tell me the process of how you overhaul the engine obviously an uh, overall facility should have the appropriate manuals they should have calibrated instruments to do all the torquing and checking um, but you kind of want to ask them can you guys just give me a rundown of how you overhaul your engines and they should have a flow you know a good shop a good overhaul shop is going to have a flow of how they do things um, recently you know we've kind of questioned some of these bigger shops on the final process of these engines and that is run up uh, you know we often get these engines I was getting uh, and I'm not going to name any shops because I don't want to do that here but we were getting engines and we couldn't find out we still it was still gray as if these guys are test running the engine after overhaul you know i that's a big step and i know it's a lot of work to to test run an engine because you got to set it up on the stand and get it ready and all this and that but like we were getting engines that, that back that were having leaks in certain areas and we're just like what the heck is going on here why do we have a leak here didn't they run it didn't they test run this thing on a seal and and so that's a big one I would ask them hey do you guys test run the engine after you've overhauled it um, because to me uh, that's a big deal that you know let's just say it's just a seal that's leaking well they sh they truck the engine clear back to you or ship it back to you then you have a leaking seal and it, it's not just the cost of the seal that's the issue here it's like now you've got it on the plane you got to remove it right it's the cost and paying the mechanic to remove it it's the time that you have to send the engine back and it's just a big fiasco so like the little bit of time that it takes to run the engine I think is appropriate uh just to it, it's not a little bit of time but the full day that it takes to be on the engine stand to run it to make sure it's not leaking is critical so the three the three things to ask an engine overhaul facility obviously price and quote but where you want to ask them what do you guys replace at overhaul what's the flow of your guys's overhaul and do you guys test run the engine after overhaul those are the three questions i would ask every shop so um, with that being said i'm going to wrap this uh this this 
show up here in this episode on piston engines and and talking a little bit about it it's been some time since i've done a show so excuse me if i bounced around on this one but stay in touch with us you know hit the like or subscribe button below because we're going to talk about aircraft maintenance uh and and it and at the end of the day you know we're gonna have a lot of good content for aircraft owners so um just hang in there and uh we appreciate any feedback so if you have any comments suggestions corrections um you know we're not perfect but uh um, we'd love to hear from you guys so make sure you comment and with that being said we'll see you guys on the next episode